Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for the invitation to come back. I had an opportunity to kind of sneak in once already, which was uh, lovely to be able to say hello to some of you and uh, find out a little bit about what, where, what you do and who you are. And um, just thought I'd start off by telling you where my accent comes from. And the reason is because otherwise you'll spend the whole service trying to figure it out. I know, I know how you are. So I was, um, it's a long story, but I was born in Oklahoma and then I grew up in Chicago. And then I lived 10 years in New York and then six years in Texas. And then I moved here into this country 23 years ago and uh, moved to Belfast, Newcastle upon Tyne, Stoke-on-Trent, sunny, warm and friendly London, and now I'm in rural Oxfordshire. So if you take all of that and mix it together, this is what you sound like. So I just thought I'd uh, answer that. Is there? 107 years old. Yes. I have often been blamed for being much older than I am, really, just by the, the lives that I've lived. But um, sincerely, thank you for this opportunity. Every time I have an opportunity to come and speak in a church, I try and pray what the Lord would have me give to you that would be meaningful to you. Even if I never saw you again, it would be something that would sink into your hearts that you could take on board from His Word be meaningful to you and you'd never forget. I say that because there was a time in my life when my dad was considering taking a job in a state I'd never lived in, West Virginia. And uh, so when I got there, I of course wanted to find out, um, I wanted to find a church, visited a church and heard a sermon preached. One time my dad didn't take the job, so we didn't move there. But I still remember the sermon that was preached in that one service. So it can be meaningful, even if you've never heard from me again, you can take what the Lord says through me to you today and have it be important. So the title of the message that I've chosen today is called Keeping It and Letting It Go. Keeping it and letting it go. It's a message that may actually be designed to raise more questions than it answers. I know that's not very helpful. All the time you have somebody who gets up on this platform, their goal is usually to try to give you some insight and answers that will help you get forward. But sometimes the ministry is uh, to help raise questions, to make you ask yourself uh, questions as you go forward. In fact, Jesus really had two flip sides to his ministry. Uh, when he was walking this earth, his primary ministry was probably to comfort the afflicted. On the other hand, he also afflicted the comforted. Those that were comfortable in where they stood, he afflicted them, kind of jabbed them a bit. And both of those were very important parts of what he did. So it may be that you're here this morning and you need comforting. And the Lord has a ministry for you that will comfort you. On the other hand, you may be here this morning and you just feel fine. You don't need anything. You're here in church because these are good people. You like singing. It's a nice building. And you come along just to be able to fellowship. And the Lord says, no, I've got something else. And he jabs you a little bit pokes you and uh, encourages you or afflicts you, we might say. If you have a Bible or a Bible app or something and you'd like to turn, please do, to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to stay in Hebrews so you won't have to go far. Otherwise, you can just listen to me and I'll read these to you. But Hebrews chapter 10 and then in a minute I'll turn over to Hebrews 12. But the first verse that I want to read is Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 23. In the NIV it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. The King James language says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. One of the things that we never want to relinquish or let go of is our faith. Once you put your faith and trust in Christ, it's important that you hang on to that at all costs. 
when I became a Christian, similar to John's story, um, you know, it, it's been a long time ago, back in 1974. But when I trusted Christ as my Savior, it answered a lot of questions for me that I had had up until that point in my life. And I've never turned my back away from those answers. I've always held the Lord and held to the faith. I remember even at one time when I was a teenager having a Lutheran preacher stick his head in the window of the car where I was and, and look at me as a teenage lad and he pointed his finger and he said, keep the faith. And I always have, whether he told me to or not. Hold fast. But then turn over one page possibly in your Bible to Hebrews 12 and I want to just look at the first verse in this chapter. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and then it says these words, let us throw off everything that hinders. King James language says, let us lay aside every weight, as if we somehow have a ball and chain on us. It says, lay aside every weight, goes on to say, in the sins that doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Because we are in a position as Christians to be on a journey, and we don't want hindrances. We won't, don't want things to hold us back. So whereas there are some things that we want to cling to and hang on to, there are some things that we need to let go of. We need to relinquish, get rid of them. I like the word jettison, you know, because it kind of has a space age sound to it. We need to send some things off from us. And those things that hold us back, we need to get rid of them. Your list would be different than mine, but at the same time, we each have things in our lives that we need to let go of. We need to put behind us and move forward. Because unless we put them behind us, we won't be able to move forward. I'm just going to divert from, from my notes for a second to just point out, you know, some people have a really good heart for the Lord. They, they want to serve the Lord and they, they have a real desire to want to serve Him, but they have a past. They've done things that they regret. And even though they've trusted Christ and they've made their commitment to Christ, there are those things that keep creeping into their minds and reminding them of just how bad they are. Just how bad the stuff is that they've done. And those memories of your past can actually hold you back. God can forgive you from those things. Even people that you've wronged can forgive you, but you might struggle to forgive yourself. You might have a difficult time saying, yeah, but it was so bad what I did. I should never have done it. It was so wrong what I did. And we have a difficult time getting beyond our own sins, forgiving ourselves. When I say this, I'm going to step into a gear here where I used to have a pastor who told me all the answers to all of my questions. I don't know if you've had pastors here who would do that. But as a teenage lad, I used to go to him quite regularly when I'd confront questions and I'd say, Pastor, what do, I be what do we believe about this? And ask him those, you know. And he would tell me what we as a church believed. And I just took it on board that that was what I believed. But I didn't personally ever come up with answers to those questions. I just took on board the answers other people gave me. That can be kind of dangerous, actually. Because we need to have our own faith that we hang on to. We need to be able to have beliefs that we agree to. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, is, is this church a, a, a spirit-filled, charismatic-type church? And then somebody might say, well, yes, it is. And yet there'll be people in that church who aren't charismatic, who don't feel the same way about interpretations of Scripture. 
They go into another church and you say, you know, it's, it says Baptist on the label or something, and you walk in and say, is this a, a kind of charismatic, is this a charismatic spirit-filled church? And then you get people say, well, no, we're not charismatic here, you know. But there'll be people in that church who would say, actually, I am. Don't say that. You know, that's not my feeling. I might be part of this church and I have to. Each of us have convictions and have beliefs that might differ from others. And it really comes down to our own personal faith and trust in Christ. We can't have someone else dictate to us what we believe. So I say that because some of you here this morning you got questions about stuff. You're not really sure just about all of it. Some of it, you might even say most of it, but not all of it. You might struggle just a little bit with some things. And that's okay as long as you finally come to grips with what you really do believe that the Bible teaches. So I'm going to talk just for a moment, when I talk about keeping and letting it go, I'm going to touch on the subject of convictions versus preferences. As a Christian, I think we have convictions. We have those things that we say, I die for. Those are beliefs that you are not going to take from me. I believe them and I will believe them until the day that I die. Those are convictions worth dying for. But then there are other things that we would have to call preferences. Those are things that I do, but I don't necessarily feel that they're absolutely necessary that I have to do them. I'll give you a for instance. I went to a church once where I heard a man talking about how he believed that as a church, they should meet on a Sunday. He, he was wholehearted and when they struggled with getting the building that they were meeting in available on a Sunday. And they were going to have to potentially move the service from Sunday to Saturday. He said, no, absolutely not. We will meet on Sunday. We'll just have to find someplace else. He said, but actually, we're not going to be able to do that. We need to meet. I'm not going to do that. He was, he, it was a strong conviction with him that it had to be on a Sunday. If the church had decided to meet on a Saturday, he was going to find another church that met on Sunday because that was important to him. There were other people there who said, I don't care what day you meet. I don't care if you meet on Friday, you know. If you're meeting regularly, great. Now, there are some things in the Bible that we would say um, the Bible teaches us to do. Those are what I call prescriptive, kind of like the doctor writes your prescription, you know. These are the things that you should do. Then there are other things in the Bible that are descriptive. This is what they did. Not necessarily what we have to do. We did one of them this morning. We took the Lord's Supper, or communion, or what's another word for it? Um, yeah, you know, all of breaking bread, that's right, from traditional, you know, brethren background, that would be that. And, uh, the, you know, communion, the Lord's Supper, breaking of bread, those are all, or the Eucharist, if you're from a high church kind of background. Well, now, there are some people who say that the Lord's Supper needs to be partaken of on a weekly basis. There are others who feel that it has to be at least monthly. Now, if we were going with a descriptive method, we would look at the Bible and see, actually, the disciples did it door-to-door -door -door on a daily basis. They were going every day to break bread. Now, what does the Bible say descriptively? The apostles did it day-to-day. -day. What does it say prescriptively? What are the words that it says? As often as you do it. So you might say, well, how often should I do it? As often as you do it. Well, what's often mean? Well, the opposite of seldom. <laughs> you know, it's easy, you know. Just as often as you do it. So those, those are 
where we get down to following the scripture's advice of what it tells us we have to do versus what the Bible says they did. As you look at the Bible, consider some of those things when you look at beliefs. Some people in the Bible spoke with tongues. Others did not. Does the Bible describe that everybody should speak with tongues? I'm not going to even answer that question. I'll let you, I'll let you deal with that one or another. You know, the gifts of the Spirit, some are evident in people's lives and others aren't. And some people get very judgmental. Be careful of this. Some people get very judgmental about the gifts of the Spirit. Do you exemplify that gift? And if you do not, then you are not right with God. You're not living according to the Bible. Just check out what the Bible says about whether you have to or whether that's not an evidence that you are filled with the Spirit, but maybe not everybody evidences it in the same way. I like to sometimes wind people up. I get that, you know, you know how it is when people have all the answers and you decide you want to make sure that they realize they don't. And so there are times, you know, somebody will say, well, I'm, you know, I'm full of the Spirit and I will speak with tongues. And I'll say, great, do you also speak the Word of God with boldness? Because I see it's another place in there. It talks about being full of the Spirit, that you speak the Word of God with boldness. And it's always bothered me when I you know, go to a service and there'll be everybody will speak with tongues and then they go out for pizza afterwards. And you say, hey, you ought to be out there speaking the Word of God with boldness afterwards. If you're following that biblical description of what happened, they were full of the Spirit and then they couldn't shut up. So how is it that we're exemplifying the gifts of the Spirit? I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying that's what they did. Look at the things that you see the Bible teaches and decide whether those are things that are actually telling me I need to do them or whether they are things that describe what the Bible says they did. We have doctrines in the church and then we have church traditions. I've been in churches that have split and divided, gone their separate ways because of tradition. Sometimes in America, churches have two flags. Here you've got loads of them, I see. Um, but they have two flags. They'll have the Christian flag, and then on the other side, they'll have the American flag. And they'll have those on the platform either side, you know. I've seen churches split because they couldn't decide which side the American flag went on and which side the Christian flag went on. And there was a real division in the church. They went two separate ways. I've been in other churches. It was even worse than that. In America, they'll have often a baptistry built behind the church platform. And oftentimes the baptistry built behind the church platform will have a picture painted of the Jordan River flowing through. That's kind of pretty, you know. They'll have the Jordan River flowing through. I've seen churches split over which direction the Jordan River is flowing through the baptistry. I could say they've done it split over which side the organ was on and which side the piano was on or which color the carpet was or whether we had the announcements at the beginning of the service or just before or even had them at all. And I've seen people become so upset when those things change. The worship group, they're on stage left. They should be on stage right. Or no, they should be in the middle. Because we're worshiping the Lord and it's important to have them right here. The podium, should it be on the right or the left or in the center? Should we even have one? Do you see how small things can become big things? Now I say this church has a history and I don't know all of it. Don't want to know all of it. But I bet there have been times through the years where people disagreed strongly 
over things that as a church some felt they were important that we do? Were they convictions? Were they doctrines? Were they, were they traditions? Were they, were they preferences? Or were they convictions? Were they things I'm worth dying for? Or are they just what we feel might be important to do at the time? What the Bible says is what's important. What it prescribes for us to do is important. What Jesus tells us we should do is important. What man thinks we should do is less important. Less important. So then we have this progression. We have a question that's posed. The way that we should proceed when we're asked a question is, what, if anything, does the Bible say about that subject? Then, does it say something specifically about that subject? Or does it just talk about it in principle? Is it a principle that I should live by? The third thing then, how am I going to respond to what the Bible says. Each of us have an opportunity to hear what the Lord says to us, and we then have a responsibility to respond to that. Am I going to do what I'm told the Bible says I should do, or am I going to say, no, I'm not going to do that? We reconcile in a world that we live in today, we've got difficult questions constantly being thrown at the church. What does the church feel about sexuality? What does the church feel about, you know, uh, permissiveness that goes on and, and acceptance and equality? What does the church say about those things? We have God's law reconciled somehow with God's love. Isn't it interesting? Nobody had more commandments than God, Jesus. You know, we have a whole Old Testament full of law. And then Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament. And Jesus seemed to be disobeying or confusing the whole thing, the law. He was meeting with people that the law says you shouldn't even give them the time of day. His disciples were eating with unwashed hands. He, as a teacher, was found washing his disciples' feet. All those things seemed to be contradictory to what he was teaching in the Old Testament. But we have God's law reconciled with God's love. Now, here's an opportunity to bring it into a modern day context. We have speed limits on our roads, don't we? Some of us are annoyed by those, you know, especially when you get into car parks where it says five and 10 miles an hour. You think, yeah, right. There's no way I'm gonna go five or 10. The one that really winds you up is when it says on a motorway, you know, 20 miles an hour maximum because they've just put gravel down. You think, you know, if I were to go 20, I'd be rear-ended by a car because there'd be, there's nobody, you know. Now, just bringing up the whole topic of speed limits, now that you're all under conviction, see? <laughs> you bring up the topic of speed limits and you have what's called the law. But then you also have this thing called the spirit of the law. Because the spirit of the law says what? Drive safely. Don't be an idiot, you know, when you're on the road. Drive safely. So they put a speed limit, what they feel would be a safe speed to go. But what if it isn't a safe speed to go? Have you ever been on a road where you get people behind you pushing you? It's pouring down rain. It's treacherous driving. The speed limit's 50, but you've decided actually 50 is a bit fast today. And you slow down to about 35, you get somebody behind, but the speed limit says 50. Actually, if you let them, they go 60 or 70 probably, but they're behind you pushing you because the law says 50. 
The spirit of the law says, safe driving, you know. So the most you can go is 50, but safely, come on, use your head. I wonder how many of our Bible passages hmm, we interpret using the spirit of the law. Why was God so dogmatic about some of the things that he said? Because we need limits. We need direction. We need instruction. We need to know. But then within it, there is the spirit of the law. And you see Jesus exercising the spirit of the law. You'll laugh when I say this, but I've been to a church in Indiana, rural Indiana, that had a sign printed on the door as you come into the sanctuary that said, no women in trousers. That's welcoming, you know. <laughs> you come, no women in trousers. And you just think, you know, just what was that about, you know? Why, and why just one thing? I mean, why not have it all, you know? Why don't you have this whole big, huge list of do's and don'ts? I know of a church in Virginia who felt that women should not wear open-toed shoes. Where in the Bible does it say you shouldn't have? You know, because people love to take and drive home what they believe you should live like. And yet God has something completely different to say to us. I told you it raised more questions than it answered. When it comes to our faith, we each have a choice to decide. What is important to me? What is really important about my faith? What do I want to hang on to? What's worth dying for? And on the other hand, what really can I let go? What's actually holding me back from serving the Lord? What is it that is keeping me from actually getting close to Him? We make and create an entire list of do's and don'ts that have absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. We have also a God who embraces people we push away. He says, I love you. He says, I accept you. Yeah, I've got some things I'd like for you to do that may be uncomfortable for you, but I love you, and I embrace you, and I accept you. And some of you need to get beyond some of the stuff that's holding you back. Get beyond some of the rules that some people have put on you that are holding you back from a close relationship with the Lord. Because you can't keep that. You can't live up to that. You live under the guilt, constant guilt, of feeling I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I can't sing in a worship group the way I am. I can't ever stand up there the way I dress, the way I, I'm just not good enough. And yet God says, actually, I love you. I love you. I embrace you. I accept you. One of the most beautiful parts of Billy Graham's ministry, we all know Billy Graham had an evangelistic ministry that attracted millions of people, millions of people. But one of the things that made his ministry so beautiful wasn't what he preached. It was the song he sang at the end. He'd always sing the same closing hymn just as I am. There was something about everything he said that was complicated, and yet then he'd come down and say, actually, just as you are, just come as you are. And then people ask Billy Graham, at what stage do you believe a person becomes a Christian? 
Is it when they come down to the front, because he'd invite them to the altar, is it when they pray the sinner's prayer and say amen and suddenly, bing, you know, now you're a Christian? When is that moment? And he said, I think they became a Christian the moment they decided to go in the aisle and walk to the front. Because that was the point that they gave their heart to the Lord. All the rest was formality. But what really drew them to Christ was when they were convinced. So how many of you in here, you think, well, I haven't followed the formula correctly. <laughs> Just ask yourself this question. Do you want Christ as your Savior? Do you want Him? If you do, just say yes. There's no proper prayer. There's no proper method. There's no proper way to have it done. Just say yes. I do. I want Him. When your heart gives itself to Christ, He'll come in. He'll do the rest. He will finish everything for you if you'll just give your heart to Him. That's worth dying for. Let's pray. Father, when we look at your word, we know that its instruction is important. We recognize that we live upon, as it's been said earlier, every word that proceeds out of your mouth. That's important to us. We look at Old Testament verses and we see how every jot and tittle is important. Every dot over the I's, every cross to the T is important. We want everything that you say, and we want to live by. But within the context of that, we also see your love and see how when we forget to dot the I, when we forget to cross the T, you still love us. You still accept us. You still want us, embrace us, encourage us, even anoint us in our failures. So Father, this morning, we want to decide for ourselves in our lives what's important that we want to keep and what isn't that we want to let go. Guide and direct us by your Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.